Good afternoon and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board, and we'll, we're about to get started. Um, we're going to start with the minutes of Wednesday, um, November 18th. Is there a motion? So moved. moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, November 18th without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show the motion carried unanimously. At this point, we're going to turn to the executive director's report. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a couple of uh, announcements. I first wanted to start with our schedule for December that is posted on our website. And I just want to give you an overview because it is a pretty busy month. Um, and there's just a couple of meetings that I want to make sure the public uh, hears about. Uh, first, uh, next Tuesday, December 1st, I cannot believe it's December already, um, we are going to have our first meeting of the Prescription Drug Technical Advisory Group, and that um, takes place from 11 to 1, um, and that is open to the public, and you can join the, the instructions for joining the meeting are on our press release. In addition, on Tuesday, December 1st, we have a Data Governance Council meeting from 2 to 3.30, also open to the public. Instructions are on our website. Uh, on Wednesday, December 2nd, we are um, having a full day of board meeting. So we're going to start at 10 a.m. with a morning board meeting, and we're going to continue the discussion on the FY21 hospital budget debrief. And then we'll come back in the afternoon starting at 1 p.m. And on our agenda that afternoon, we'll have the 2020 update to the health information, uh, the 2018 to 2022 health information exchange strategic plan with a potential vote. And then we'll also have a 2019 ACO financial results panel. And last, we'll have an all payer model update from our staff. And then on Wednesday, December 9th, um, uh, in, in the afternoon only that day at 1 p.m., we um, We'll have the ACO oversight FY21 staff analysis and preliminary recommendations on their budget. Um, and then on this Wednesday, December 9th, the same day in the evening, we from five to seven, we're convening our primary care advisory group. Again, open to the public and the information is on our website. The next week, Wednesday, December 16, we have a panel discussion on provider reimbursement in Vermont, and that starts at 1 p.m. And then the next week, two days before Christmas, we um, have Wednesday, December 23rd, the Accountable Care Organization Oversight FY21 ACO budget potential vote. Right now, we don't have anything um, scheduled on Wednesday, December 30th, but with um, activities around the ACO budget benchmark, all things um, finishing up the end of the year, we may have an additional agenda items which will be posted appropriately. So when you have a chance, take a look at that uh, schedule it's again on our website. And I did wanna just make um, a few remarks before we turn it over to our partners at AHS who are going to be presenting to us today. I wanna thank them for coming in and um, sharing uh, the all peer model, ACO model agreement implementation improvement plan report. Um, so we were really looking forward to hearing this update from Secretary Smith and Director of Healthcare Reform for AHS, Ina Backus. Um, as background, I wanted to let uh, the board know and the public know that this plan was developed in consultation with the Green Mountain Care Board staff. While the feedback from the board staff incorporated um, the, uh, into this report generally mirrors views expressed historically by the board, 
the regulatory strategies included in the report have not yet been discussed in a public meeting, and that's why we're here today. So um, the purpose of the discussion today is to receive the overview from, of the plan from our partners at AHS and for the board to discuss the regulatory strategies specifically. I mean, we could, we're going to talk about the whole report, but specifically around the regulatory um, strategies at our public meeting today. Uh, staff and I will continue to analyze these recommendations recommendations and we'll seek your opinion uh, as an, an independent board on how these may be implemented in the future. And it's likely that the staff uh, and you will continue these discussions at future board meetings. I also want to note that Elena Berby, who's the Director of Health Systems Policy, will be, she's on the line and will be available too if there are um, questions regarding specific GMCB activities that our AHS partners um, uh, obviously may not have an answer to, but I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair, and I want to wish everybody happy Thanksgiving tomorrow, too, before I forget. So thank you, Susan. Um, I'm trying to do a little soft shoot here, but Ina, um, let me uh, um, ask you a question. I understand the uh, secretary um, has been delayed. Can you proceed without him, or how should we I, uh, handle this? I Mr. believe Chair. he is here. Mr. Oh. Chair, I am actually here. Oh, good. <laughs> I knew that if uh, people wanted me to uh, sing and dance, we were in trouble. <laughs> I could have done a tap dance too, Kevin. I I, I do know the soft show, so. He, so he said, he said, beam me down, Scotty, and there he was. <laughs> So um, I'm not sure which of you is going to uh, lead it off, but uh, whenever you're ready, proceed. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you for having both Ina and I here today. As you know, um, after the federal government issued a warning letter because Vermont fell short of its scale targets for uh, two consecutive years in its all-payer model, I asked Ina Backus and a team uh, at AHS to really take a critical look at um, the all-payer model and pr produce a report with findings and recommendations about where we are in the model and what actions do we need to take to do in order to move forward in the model. And what uh, Ina and her team produced, I think can be aptly described as a blunt uh, outlook of faults and issues and what we need to do to change for the model to be successful. And I appreciate all the work that Ina and her team did in bringing this report together. Um, I really believe uh, this is something, this is a blueprint uh, to, to success. Um, and, and how we looked at this is in four sort of separate buckets. Um, we looked at it from what do our federal partners have to do or change uh, to make the model successful? An example would be to treat Medicare as a true perspective payment system. It's not right now. Uh, what do we have to do at AHS to make the model uh, successful? And frankly, we need to make major organizational changes to align the various healthcare reform efforts and operations here at the agency. I'm looking out the window, it's an empty building. I'm sitting in an empty building, but I'm looking out the window here. Um, we, we have to make changes here uh, because we're fairly dispersed in, in our efforts, in our reform efforts here within the agency. Um, and then externally, what does the ACO, One Care, have to do? And we're recommending a, a new leadership perspective uh, with the ACO. And then what does the Green Mountain Care Board uh, need to do? And how do you align those to make sure the model is successful as we, we uh, go down uh, this path together? Um, Mr. Secretary, can I just uh, stop you for one second? I did get a text from someone saying that there's a bad echo. I'm not receiving it here, but if 
Um, anybody is on the line and is not muted, if they could mute themselves, that would be greatly appreciated. Sorry about that, Mike. No, that's okay. So why are we doing it? And, and I'll, there are three reasons that come to my mind why we're doing this. Um, I've seen the advantage of the value-based payment system. Um, it gave us, and I've said this before before the board, it gave us tremendous uh, flexibility and provided stability within the healthcare system when the first wave of the pandemic, I used to say the height of the pandemic, now I have to say the first wave of the pandemic uh, came through and it really rocked us. It really rocked the healthcare system. Uh, and we were able to move money in order to stabilize operations throughout the uh, healthcare system. We wouldn't have been able to do that without the value-based uh, payment system uh, that we we have at our disposal, mostly Medicaid money right at the moment. Fixed fee, um, you know, a fixed fee system provides incentives and drives costs that are sort of perverse to what we're trying to do, which is cost containment and enhanced quality. And I, I, I've said a lot on that in, in various forums, but I truly believe value-based system is the way to go. I, I, I make no bones about that as I look to the future. Um, and then this system that we have now needs active engagement to get it on the right path. I, I just didn't believe we were on the right path. I didn't believe we were engaged enough to put it on the right path. I didn't believe um, we had all our sort of focus on what can be done to put this on the right path. And I think the active engagement is important on this. And, and I've committed to be actively engaged in this process, both with the report and moving forward. I mean, the report is the easy part, frankly. The harder part is gonna be implementing all the, all the recommendations that are in the report. So with that sort of introduction, um, I'll turn this presentation over to Ina to go through the specifics of what's in, in the report. So Ina, take it away, please. Thank you, Secretary Smith. That's Abigail, cool. would Is that would Wally you... in the background, by the way, that I'm hearing? <laughs> Hopefully not too much. <laughs> <laughs> Abigail, would you like me to share slides from my platform or would you like to share the slides that I've provided? It'd be easier if you could do that, Ina, but if you need me to, I'm available. Oh, I will initiate that now. And I do want to thank uh, Executive Director Susan Barrett and her staff for the many hours of work spent, uh, as she mentioned, collaborating and consulting uh, with us as we were putting together this report. Um, that consultation as uh, co-signatories, so to speak, certainly strengthened this work and is is incredibly important as, um, as Secretary Smith mentioned, the work now is ahead of us um, in implementing these recommendations. And we wanted to certainly be sure that, um, that we worked with you um, where applicable on the recommendations. As, as was described, recommendations for improving our performance in the all payer model agreement are divided into four key areas, which include um, thinking about in using and maximizing our federal state partnership to achieve the ends of, of success in this agreement. Um, reorganizing and prioritizing uh, the all-payer program within AHS. Some recommendations um, for the Green Mountain Care Board that we think are consistent um, with the recommendations that are put forward in this report about the leadership perspective at the ACO and the focus that we believe is necessary on the core business um, of the Accountable Care Organization in 
identifying areas for efficiency in the healthcare system as well as quality improvement. With respect to the federal state partnership, we've identified six key recommendations and strategies to uh, move progress in this agreement and to position us uh, potentially um, for success in another potential agreement. First, we believe that the scale targets should be looked at again with CMS in order that we have a good discussion about how those targets can reflect uh, the realistic capacity for participation in this model in our state. As you're familiar, the denominator that it is um, currently in place for these scale targets captures a number of Vermonters or holds us accountable for Vermonters to be attributed to the model who are not able to be attributed to the model, who cannot be attributed based on the attribution uh, mechanism. We also recommend, and um, this is a recommendation consistent with work that has already taken place today, that the Medicare risk corridors be reduced uh, to decrease the financial burden of participation for hospitals. And as has been discussed by this board in public meetings, um, this, this uh, approach is important, particularly given the financial impact of the pandemic and is important for uh, garnering additional participation in the model um, among hospitals uh, today. We'd also like to recommend, we also recommend that we request um, CMS to work with us, the state of Vermont, to establish written guidance and best practices with respect to the critical access hospitals. As you are also familiar, the critical, hosp critical access hospitals cost reporting requirements are uh, based in the fee-for-service system and therefore uh, need to be considered differently when critical access hospitals are participating in value-based payment models. We also want to uh, establish a path for the Medicare payment model to mirror the Vermont Medicaid next generation fixed perspective payments. This is really the premise of the uh, value-based payment reform that we are trying to achieve in Vermont to move aggressively away from fee-for-service reimbursement and to provide predictable, fixed, uh, and sufficient payments to participating providers. And Medicare uh, should be aligned in this approach, and we'd like to accelerate that work with CMS. Further, we want to ensure that the Medicare 2021 benchmark can provide as much stability and predictability as possible, despite the ongoing uncertainty that's associated with the global health pandemic. And we, we want to collaborate with CMMI to encourage the Health Resources and Services Administration, commonly called HRSA, to prioritize value-based payment for federally qualified health centers. The Agency of Human Services is going to prioritize this model and accelerating participation by conducting education and outreach to non-participating self-funded groups about the benefits of participating in value-based payment models. And this includes the state and health, health employee plan members. However, these mem the, the final decision has been made that the state employee health plan member members will be attributed to One Care Vermont in, in 2021. We also want to prioritize the integration of claims and clinical data in the health information exchange. And this is one of the components that Secretary Smith referred to when he, he spoke about uh, the reorganization within the Agency of Human Services around the goals of healthcare reform. We, we are reorganizing some key programs in the Agency of Human Services 
which all uh, have a focus on healthcare reform um, and certainly can accelerate progress in the all payer model, bringing them together uh, very specifically with the goals of, of enhancing our progress in our all payer model agreement um, is, is one of our strategies for improving. Health information exchange is, um, and the information available through it is a backbone for healthcare reform for providers who need data and information to inform care and decision making and claims and clinical data, if integrated, can, can be an even stronger resource in this aspect. So we are proposing to bring together the HIE as well as the patient-centered medical home program, the Blueprint for Health, along with the Vermont Chronic Care Initiative, um, which provides for currently outreach and engagement of those Vermonters who are attributed to One Care Vermont and yet do not have primary care providers. Um, the VCCI program is working with One Care Vermont and, and is, is um, helping Vermonters who do not have a primary care uh, provider to identify one. Bringing all of these functions together within the Office of Healthcare Reform at the Agency of Human Services is one of our key initiatives um, to accelerate progress and to um, ensure that we are working in alignment and in the complementary function with One Care Vermont. We also want to partner with One Care as well as the delivery system users to evaluate the efficacy of the Care Navigator platform. As you are familiar, uh, there is mixed, there's a mixed um, assessment of Care Navigator as a helpful tool in, in coordinating care. We, the, the care coordination tool is certainly central to uh, improved coordination, uh, improved experience of care, a seamless experience of care for, for Vermonters uh, attributed to the ACO. And we want to be sure that the platform for care coordination is the, the best available tool. We also, uh, in the spirit, as I just described, of aligning the patient-centered medical home work as much as possible um, with our, our emphasis on value-based payments, we would like to take a phased approach um, to condition participation in Blueprint for Health PCMH payments on participation in value-based payment arrangements with an ACO. Further, we are recommending that AHS, One Care Vermont, and community and community-based providers work together to improve collaboration and strengthen integrated primary specialty and community-based care models for people with complex medical needs and medical and social needs. And again, organizing our efforts um, with the Vermont Chronic Care Initiative and the Blueprint for Health together uh, in alignment with uh, healthcare reform and under the goals of the all-payer model agreement is a strategy that we've identified to improve in this area. AHS and One Care Vermont, along with community provider partners, should identify a timeline and milestones for incorporating social determinants of health screening into the standard of care for health and human services settings. And this recommendation, as you are familiar, is speaking to the population health outcomes targets, in particular in our agreement, that seek to reduce deaths due to drug overdose and suicide. AHS through the Blueprint for Health will also jointly explore with One Care and stakeholders the best available tools for capturing real-time patient feedback and to pilot uh, this methodology or identified methodologies with willing primary care practices. This recommendation is in the spirit of capturing uh, real-time feedback from, uh, from Vermonters, um, particularly because we are um, in a system that is in transition and a system that is focused on transformation. And it's important to understand 
the impact of those efforts um, in real time. And finally, in this category of recommendations, AHS and the Green Mountain Care Board working together uh, will prioritize more regular stakeholder engagement opportunities uh, to share progress on the agreement implementation and to um, and to hear from from stakeholders. In the category of recommendations um, that are really focused on uh, the regulation of the accountable care organization and um, as ascertaining progress in this agreement, we're um, we're recommending that the Green Mountain Care Board and and AHS request that Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont, MVP, and One Care Vermont identify clear milestones for including fixed prospective payments in contract model design. Further, we recommend that under the authorities of ACO and hospital budgets, that the board should explore how ACO participants can move incrementally towards value-based incentives with the providers that they employ so that the um, models for, for provider payment within the organizations that contract with the ACO reflect the, the value-based contract terms um, that that organization has with the ACO. And finally, annually in its, in its budget presentation to the board, we recommend that One Care should identify cost growth drivers across its network and detail its approaches to curb spending growth uh, relative to the cost growth drivers are, that are identified and also identify its approaches to improving quality. And the final category of recommendations speaks to the leadership perspective at the accountable care organization. Um, consistent uh, with other recommendations that you've heard, we recommend that One Care elevate data as a value added product for its network participants and support providers in leveraging this information for change. And this, um, this recommendation relates to a series of other recommendations in section two, again, that of our report, again, that are focused on strengthening the ACO leadership strategy. We'd like to recommend a focus on entrepreneurship and and in that focus, um, understand how the ACO can ease providers transition to value-based payment and delivery system redesign. Um, again, as I've said, um, we, we want and we are recommending that the ACO identify and perfect its core business. We recommend that the ACO relative to recommendation 13 provide useful, actionable information and tools to participating providers and improve how it packages information for providers. We recommend fostering a culture of continuous improvement, innovation, and learning through this focus on, on data, through identifying systems for improvement where data indicates need for improvement, and through tracking of results against the targets for improvement. And finally, we recommend that uh, transparency and responsiveness to partner requests for information um, be, uh, be held um, uh, at, at the highest standard and that we would expect some improvement in, in transparency and responsiveness to requests for information. And that those conclude, these are a summary of the recommendations in the report. Um, I know that you have the report and I certainly invite um, uh, a reading of the report in full as these summary recommendations um, are intended uh, to be brief in nature and, and certainly do not have all of the background associated with them. Thank you, Ina. Appreciate your, your presentation here, Kevin. Um, Mr. Chair, um, it, we're, we're here at your pleasure. You're muted. 
probably the most sense I made all day. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Secretary. And uh, um, on behalf of the board, I want to thank you for your leadership on this. And, you know, ever since uh, I stepped into uh, the role as chair of this board, I've had different providers say to me um, things like, well, we're not convinced the state of Vermont is fully behind the all-payer model. And I said, well, what are you talking about? It, it was signed by the state of Vermont. Uh, it is the state of Vermont's agreement. And and I've heard the governor on a number of occasions um, mention the work of the model. But um, clearly, uh, I think uh, a number of providers around the state were seeking more in the form of uh, leadership from uh, state government. And you have provided that. So thank you. Um, I'm going to open it up to the board for any um, questions or feedback to the secretary um, or to uh, Ina. And uh, I guess I'll go in alphabetical order, um, starting with Jessica. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, can everybody hear me? We can. Yeah. Okay. So thank you for all the hard work on this report. You know, it's clear we're at a critical juncture here as we you know, are approaching the end of this agreement. And there's plenty of time left, I think, to build on successes and overcome weaknesses. And especially as we're thinking about another agreement with CMS. So there's lots to learn and build on. Um, I have some questions on some of the recommendations. So let me um, talk through them. Recommendation two proposed a reduction in the Medicare risk corridor, which I know we've already implemented for 2021. And there was a clear need for that, for carrots to entice more providers into Medicare lowering the risk made sense with COVID and the financial vulnerability of hospitals. I'm wondering your views on kind of beyond 2021 is a one and a half percent or even a 2% risk corridor across the whole system enough to incentivize the types of changes that we hope to see in the delivery system. And related to that, um, should the risk corridor in your mind be the same across all hospitals or you know, should hospitals that are largely referring, you know, out for costly care bear the same risk as hospitals that are delivering that higher cost care? So how do you think about, you know, going forward recommendations around the risk corridor and the distribution of that risk within the system? You know, let me, uh, thank you. Uh, let me take the first part of that question about the risk corridor and then I'll, I'll give enough time for Ina to think about the uh, second part of the question. Uh, on this. But the first part of the question is, no, uh, we've got to expand the risk order at certain points. I think it's going to be incrementally that we expand the risk order, uh, risk uh, corridor at certain points. But yeah, we, we you know, you got to have skin in the game. Um, now, this is an exceptional year, as as everybody knows. And and I think, you know, we we have to make sure that people understand and get comfortable with the model. Uh, and I think, you know, bringing the risk order down to allow people to enter the the all payer model in a way that they feel comfortable with, I think, is important. But I think eventually, as people get more comfortable with accepting risk, as taking risk, ha have the tools to manage their risk, I, I think, you know, the, we need to talk about expanding the risk order as we move on. You know, do you want to take the second part of that question, which is, do you see different sort a differential within the risk order? I think that gets a little messy, but I'll leave it to uh, Ina to explain. I, I agree that uh, we we do want to see the risk move incrementally and that we are in an exceptional time now. And I also think um, to your question, board member Holmes, that the ACO um, has arrived at the delegated risk strategy. Um, the delegated risk strategy is not one that is prescribed in the agreement and that that gives some flexibility for the ACO uh, to consider how to delegate risk in the future, particularly as um, more experience is gained um, in participation and as a different complement of providers uh, begin participating in the program, we hope. We hope to see some more participation, particularly in Medicare. And I think um, it, is fair, it, is, it is fair to acknowledge um, that as providers begin participating, they have different um, degrees of experience um, with risk. 
Yeah, and I just, I, I want to expand on that because I think it's important. Not everybody's created equal. Uh, and so I think you have, and this is part of the entrepreneurship we were talking about, how you, how you innovate, how your entrepreneurship in trying to find out your customer base and what it needs in order to be successful. And I think, you know, the, the, you brought up a question, you brought up the second part of your question that I think is important. Um, you know, what, what does the ACO need out there from their customers in order to make, you know, the, this work? And I think, you know, not all, not all risk is equal uh, as, we, as we look at this. Well, so on a related note, I think one of the biggest customers potentially of One Care Vermont is, is Dartmouth Hitchcock, right? It's a founder. Uh, it's the tertiary care center of choice for many Vermont residents on the eastern part of the state. So what, in your vision, what is, you know, should there be an enhanced role of Dartmouth Hitchcock in Vermont's healthcare reform? How do we entice Dartmouth Hitchcock to be all in? What is the role in the kind of implementation the next few years of Dartmouth Hitchcock, if you're able to share any insights there. Yeah, uh, board member Holmes, you led me right down the road on this, didn't you? You, you, you set your questions up that led me right into that. Um, let me, um, we need Dartmouth to participate. I, I think it's important at Dartmouth, it, it, you know, we all know right now that Dartmouth isn't particular. They're they're a founder of the ACO, but in many respects, they aren't participating in the value-based payments that that I envision. Uh, they certainly aren't in Medicare. They certainly aren't in Medicaid. Um, and and I would like to see them participate in the all payer in the all payer model in a way where I'm trying to drive it, which is the value-based payment. I just I. Um, I said this in the press conference. I don't think it's a matter of if a value-based pay payment is coming, it's when it's coming. And, and I think you see it on the federal level, whether it's the Trump administration or even the Biden administration. I think you see va value-based payment is coming down, down the road and for good reasons. You know, I, I mentioned a couple of good reasons uh, during my intro, but I think we need to entice um, uh, Dartmouth to become more active in sort of the value-based uh, methodology that we're requiring, that we're, we're advocating for all Vermont hospitals. Um, and so I, I don't know if I answered your question. Well, it's a tough one. I mean, it's a tough question. How do we entice them? But I guess maybe to the degree that we're uh, expecting some entrepreneurial innovation from the ACO. Maybe there are some creative strategies that yeah. could be deployed there. But I do think it's an it's a notable absence given, you know, their founding role and the importance in terms of tertiary care, which is high cost care typically, right? So I agree. Um, one of the findings related to low participation in the self-funded market, and Cigna was mentioned as a payer with substantial number of contracts in the state, and I, I wondered, I noticed some of the tactics that fell under recreation, recommendation seven, um, there wasn't really a, a recommendation around working directly with payers like Cigna, you know, um, and I understand there are federal limitations on ERISA plans, and all of that, but I wonder, are there any tools in DFR's toolkit to entice payers like Cigna to participate in health reform efforts or any other carrots the state might offer directly working with some of those payers um, who are basically, you know, administering those self-funded plans? What else can we do there, I guess, directly with the payers or the administrators, I should say? Yeah, the, the, the gist of some of the recommendations in terms of expanding uh, participation uh, among the payers, in, in particular, um, and an and attribution to the to the model, um, is something that I think is important. And we had it in in we need to find ways to sit down with those payers to figure out what they um, what we can do in order to to entice them into the model. Because, you know, we can, we can serve, Medicaid's almost all in, 
so it, it, with the value base. I'd like to get Medicare in, but we we don't we don't make this model successful unless we get the commercials in, and that is um, that is one of the things that um, you know we plan. And one of the recommendations was I have to sit down with them and figure that out. Um, Blue Cross Blue Shield MVP, uh, you know all the all of them uh, in terms of who they who they are. So I'm planning to do that. I sit down, talk to them wonder what some of the uh, hurdles are for them in order to participate and see if we can get them into this all payer model. I think it's important. And you know if I have to, if Mike Pichek has to be right with me um, to do that, that's fine too. Okay. Um, I had a question about uh, recommendation nine. This was around we should ex the Green Mountain Care Board should explore how ACO participants can move incrementally towards value-based incentives for the providers they employ. So we don't typically regulate employee contracts. I'm just curious what if you could you know share with me a little bit more about your vision about how we might move incrementally towards. Uh, you know, regulating in that way, if that's what you're thinking. I mean, we don't typically get involved in employer employee contracts. So just curious as to what your vision was there. Yeah, Ina, you want to start out with that and then I'll finish up with that. Sure. I I think the vision is is to is is really based in the principle that if uh, providers do not have incentives that are aligned with the value based model, that the the delivery system transformation is not going to be um, is not, it it perhaps won't be followed through on that you really amplify the transformation when the provider incentives are aligned with the goals and with and with the value based model. So, for instance, I think one of the things that we consider to be an incentive that would be aligned with value based payment would be. Um, uh, uh, a, a reward for performance in in quality, for instance, rather than um, there being bonuses for um, not rather than uh, I excuse me uh, bonuses for quality performance in addition um, to other other terms. I don't think that we have a vision for um, exactly how that happens, but we think it's a important conversation to have and because the board does have authority over both hospital budgets and ACO um, that is that is why we we recommended that the board consider this um, this area so um, that's where we're coming from really are providers being paid in a way that supports the goals of the value based model and the goals are if the goals are quality improvement, which they absolutely are, are providers being rewarded when they achieve high quality outcomes in this model. Okay. Um, I, I think my second to last question is Kevin, just so you know. <laughs> Um, recommendation 14 proposed conditioning the blueprint payments on participation in the ACO. I'm just wondering if you had any sense of how many additional practices or attributed lives that might add to the model in terms of having a scale impact if there was that conditioning. We need we need to do that analysis in terms of scale impact. I think the the other the other piece of it, well, there there could be an impact on scale. I think it's also important that this rec recommendation really reflects that we have our healthcare reform priorities aligned um, and that if we are we're we have a strong patient centered medical home program that program doesn't include risk if we think that risk and skin in the game is important for performance in value based payment model then do we want then then the idea behind this recommendation is that uh, the patient center medical home program is something to participate in. So as as long as uh, you are also participating in the value based payment model. And, and I just want to make sure everybody understands we're going to phase this if we if we implement this, we're going to phase it slowly in. This is not going to be an overnight thing. 
Yes, this is a longer term recommendation. This recommendation is is um, primarily in the service of the financial performance on the financial targets um, as well. Right. Um, and I guess my last question is, it's more of a thought, but a question um, is embedded in it. I totally agree with the two overarching principles. We need to increase scale and we need to move more revenue into fixed perspective payment. Um, but obviously that's gonna take a little bit of time. And I'm just wondering, has AHS considered undertaking a study on low value care in the state, right? This is the care that provides little or no benefit to patients, has potential to cause harm, adds waste to an already resource constrained system. There are widely accepted lists of surgeries and diagnostic tests that fall into this category. And it would be really helpful to know where it's happening, how often it's happening, by whom, and what it costs us. And my thought, I guess, was, uh, you know, Diva has the incentive as a primary payer to want to know where all this low value care might be if it does exist. And the Department of Health has this medical expertise with Dr. Levine at the helm, who's done such a phenomenal job and has such wonderful expertise. I wondered whether AHS might be uniquely positioned to use claims data, to use medical evidence, to identify areas in the state where we are seeing low value care. Um, there was a study in Virginia that looked at 44 low value services in their using their all payer claims database. They found $600 million in unnecessary services and added costs. So just wondered whether this might be a way to expedite, you know, our health reform efforts, right? A study in Vermont could shine lights on areas where the delivery reform system or delivery reform change could have the greatest impact and work simultaneously as we're trying to add scale and trying to shift more payments actually targeting those areas where we're seeing low value care. Just wondered if that was anything that had been considered given some of the, the expertise at AHS and some of the incentives by being a payer. It it wasn't considered because we we didn't look at, we we're looking precisely at the all payer model, but th it is something you just sparked my interest in. Uh, so let me, let's share take that. I with you if you like, if that would be helpful. <laughs> okay, Virginia study, but. Yeah. Let me um, let us think about that. That's not that's not something I um, want to dismiss at all. So great. Well, thank you so much for all of the hard work here, and I look forward to you know improving upon what we've already built. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jess. Robin. Thanks. Um, thank you very much for the presentation, uh, and I appreciate. Um, you being here today to answer our questions. Um, so on the recommendation for related to establishing a path to move Medicare payments to uh, a fixed, a, a different type of fixed perspective payment, I was glad to see um, the concept of developing really the modeling that we would need to get there. Um, because I, my assumption was, given the short time frame, you had to put together the report that you probably have not done modeling on um, some of the unique features of Medicare that may make um, sense to have some differences from the Medicaid payment methodology. Um, I do think it's an area we should should explore because I I think that there's a lot of confusion in the provider community right now about the fixed perspective payments in Medicare and how those do or do not relate to the benchmark. Um, so I think one of the lessons learned from the previous negotiation is um, trying to really model some of those changes and get provider feedback in advance of implementation. And I think, you know, we tried to do that before in the first negotiation, but, um, it's certainly, I think, working very differently than we had kind of envisioned at that time. Um, so I think it is important to try and educate providers uh, as part of this path to, so that they have an understanding of how the current model works as well, uh, because there really is, is no connection between what they get paid in their fixed perspective payment and the benchmark that we uh, set in terms of the data, et cetera. So, um, I just wanted to make that comment really more for, for us to uh, think about, uh, both the board to think about, and of course, in partnership with you uh, in terms of what that path might look like. 
Um, in terms of the Medicare benchmark in 2021 and the stability and predictability, I totally agree. I think that's something that our staff has been working on. Um, I also think that we're probably going to have to look for that in 2022 because uh, 2022 would be informed by 2020 data, which we know is problematic. So um, I do think that may be more of a two-year endeavor uh, because of the data sources. Um, in terms of, so I'm going to switch to, I just wanted to make those couple comments on those issues. Um, I wanted to, my question, next question is really around the recommendation 11 around the claims and clinical data integration in the HIE. Um, the timing seems a little disconnected with what's in the HIE plan, um, just to be frank. So that may be something that we want to try and true up in the next week before we vote on it. Um, the because the HIE plan calls for starting with a Medicaid pilot, which I think is is consistent with the timing that you've your short to medium term timing that you've indicated in the report. But um, I think, as we all know, Medicaid claims data is very different than commercial and Medicare claims data. So, um, uh, so I just wanted to bring that up in terms of were you thinking in terms of your timing to accelerate that more quickly beyond just the Medicaid pilot? I was. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Great. So that would be um, great to connect to Emily Richards on, Ina, so that we can try and true that up before we vote on it. Um, I did have a bunch of questions for Emily around the claims and clinical data in terms of how that interfaces with VCURES, but I know that our staff, Sarah Lindbergh, is going to be participating in that work. So. Um, I do think at some point we're going to have to do a deeper dive around that because I would like to understand how it connects with VCURES and uh, make sure we are not creating redundancies and that kind of thing. Um, in terms of the data and information, um, certainly I agree we've heard very mixed reviews around Care Navigator in terms of, for example, the Brattleboro community seems to love it. Everybody in Brattleboro, like their comments in Rural Health Services Task Force was, hey, why isn't everybody using this? Why isn't AHS using this? Why isn't, you know, the homeless shelter, everybody? So I do think figuring out whether it's the right tool and doing some sort of evaluation, if that makes sense. But I don't think that just the tool itself is the only component in terms of provider satisfaction. So I was wondering what your thoughts were around not just looking at the tool, but the implementation of the tool in the communities. Ina, do you want to take that? I, th I think that's a good recommendation, Robin. I think that there's there is the tool itself, and then there's also um, who can um, and, and in in our recommendation, I think we were thinking about um, evaluating the tool and and really looking at who and how the tool is being used now, the use cases for it and what's missing from that. So I think um, you're providing some additional context, but it's it's absolutely in line with what we were thinking. Um, and, and, and I appreciate you explaining that piece um, at this time. That is certainly what we're thinking. And I think we'd like to be, we'd like to see an expanded portfolio of users for Care Navigator, for instance. So, in a particular community where there um, is there's uh, an identified need for more of the care continuum to be able to use that platform, how can that? How can we um, see that uh, to reality? So, yes, that's that's absolutely in the spirit of what we're considering with this evaluation. Great, because I think that. Um, uh, if it's not the right tool, then it makes sense to identify that sooner than later. But it it was quite a mammoth undertaking to get it rolled out. So I do think it could cause a hiccup to re-roll out a tool statewide. So I think that needs to be sort of in, in the thinking too, is not just like yes or no right tool, but how do we make sure we don't disrupt ourselves? Or if we do think we should switch gears, when is the right time to do that? Because it will be a several months retraining and re-rollout, which uh, will obviously have impacts on people's work and uh, the results. Um, 
in terms of the blueprint recommendation, have I was curious, and I didn't look it up, whether that requires statutory change. The the recommend um, are you speaking? Which recommendation are you speaking about related to the blueprint? Um, to condition the payments to participation in the ACO. This this is a longer term recommendation, as we indicated, and it's one that we have to spend some time exploring, and that's a piece that we will be be looking into. Okay, um, I that sounds great. I was just curious about that, and um, of course, it's uh, the blueprint payments are also required to be paid by the the commercial payers as well. So, um, right. I assume that's an area that you still need to look into in terms of talking to them about the feasibility of that recommendation, et cetera. Okay. Um, the, the only last thing I will say is that uh, at least with the Medicare dollars, I think as Ina knows, that was not the expectation um, for the use of those dollars. So I do think, I'm glad it's a longer term recommendation because I think there's a lot of exploration that needs to happen, um, including on the total cost of care, because if you have people dropping out of the blueprint, for example, which is obviously not the goal, the goal would be to have people remain in the blueprint and move to the ACO as well. But if you had some provider retraction, um, those savings from the blueprint participation uh, are helping us in the total cost of care, even if those members are not in the ACO. So I do think it's a more complicated cost analysis. Okay, I think I'm coming to a close. Um, uh, so um, again, on the commercial, just touched on this in terms of the commercial payer participation. Um, I do think in, I'm all for uh, having more explicit milestones in terms of FPP development. It's something that, um, one of us usually asks both the carriers and the ACO about during our regulatory processes. We always, uh, uh, some of the ACO stuff in the commercial uh, rate review process is proprietary, so some of that is in the executive session, but we do usually explore them what's the hang up in terms of moving more quickly there. So I think having a more public milestone chart or plan uh, makes sense. I do think it's important to include DFR because they have the regulatory authority over market conduct. So um, I would hope that we could include them as well in that effort. And then I think that Jess asked the other questions that I had. So why don't we move on to someone else? Thank you, Robin. Tom. Well, here, here we are, Robin, at the other side of Berlin. Um, we just live across the valley from each other. Um, I'm very grateful for the work that you two have done and your teams in terms of putting this together. Because, you know, for me, I'll be, you know, very frank about it. Sometimes I, I get lost in in all of the interconnectivity of all this, and and just, you know, would like someone to come in and say. Here's where you got to go, and, and once I have a target of where I got to go, I can usually get there. But um, with it spread across this landscape, it's a little bit difficult. And so, one area I want to uh, point at is our recommendations eight and nine. And you know, in the the language is like identify clear milestones for including fixed prospective payments and move incrementally toward value based incentives. And I agree with that. I mean, I, 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 I get the concept that fixed prospective payments are a key to the front door in, in all of this. But then I look at some of the data, and here we are you know, in the third year of the all-payer model heading into the fourth, and I look at the um, expenditures <clears throat> to providers uh, through the ACO, um, and their proposed budget for 2021 is $1.4 billion and 33% of that is fixed prospective payment and nine uh, at 474 million and 932 million is still fee for service. And I, you know, I don't know, 
I mean, I've talked to the staff about where should we be in these kinds of relationships, and they're saying somewhere between 30 and 50 percent is when you begin to get to the point that you can leverage the improvements that we're all hoping for in the system. So, um, and in terms of our hospital budgets for 2021, you know, of the total 2.8 billion in um, <clears throat> net patient revenues, only 13.9 percent of it of was uh, tied to fixed prospective payments. Um, uh, at 389 million. So for me, it would be helpful if we could get to a consensus sooner rather than later. And I, I know uh, uh, next next to the um, item number eight and nine, it has a short and medium term and number nine has a longer term. The sooner I think that we can get to targets that we all agree on in terms of fixed prospective payments and as they flow through this system, the easier it will be to explain what we're doing and 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 how we're doing it and why we're doing what we do and why us bad old regulators are insisting on higher and higher levels of fixed uh, fixed prospective payments. So um, I guess that's just my hope is that that eight and nine can be put up on a higher priority that we can find a consensus among the board um, and uh, the ACO and AHS to say. Here's where we're going. This is the number we got to hit. Um, and you regulators, uh, you play a key role in that in terms of rate review and hospital budgets and the ACO budget. And uh, um, um, so just to get some reaction on that, is that what what was the timeline when you say short, medium term and longer term for eight and nine? Uh, what do you have in mind? Sure, thank you very much. Um, short term was a week, uh, medium term was two weeks, and longer term was a month. I'm kidding. Uh, no, you're not. No, you're not. <laughs> I know you too well. You're not kidding. <laughs> um, we we have an index up there. A short term is 20 and 21. Uh, medium term is 22, and longer term is 22 and beyond. Um, I I do think you raise some valid points. Uh, that we really need to sort of pinpoint that a little bit more um, definitively, I think is is the word I would use. So um, let's take let me take back that uh, suggestion and look at this a little bit more. Yeah. Well, it would just be helpful. I mean, we use the three and a half percent number quite a bit um, in our hospital budget guidelines and things. And I'm sure it's not a perfect number. You know, when we were up on the fifth floor, the numbers we were using were perfect numbers, but they were guiding and guiding stars. And uh, uh, it's just it's just helpful to know know where you're trying to get to, um, because if you don't have it defined and you don't get there, who who knows the difference? Yeah. Um, so uh, another area is uh, in the plan, at least in the in the narrative in the beginning, it talks about. Healthcare reform activities at AHS not clearly organized for success, uh, um, and in terms of the agreement's performance, and there are a couple of areas that that uh, I still don't understand why we haven't gotten there yet. And one of them, I, I'm and I'm very glad to see in the ACO budget this alignment of self-management plans um, uh, <clears throat> of, uh, at, at the blueprint, um, but but I don't think that. There's good alignment between the benchmark plan and, um, uh, for example, the blueprint plan on prediabetes. Um, in the blueprint plan, there is no benefit associated with prediabetes, yet this is one of the more severe chronic diseases that we're trying to address in this whole all-pair model um, effort. Um, and uh, so you can go to a bronze plan and get uh, a couple of... Uh, um, um, sessions with a nutritionist, but that's not in any kind of organized way tied to the blueprints CDC approved plan for prediabetes, and um, which is which is the gold star plan from what I everything I understand. So again, I'm just urging that um, that, and I think it's more in in, in Diva's uh, ballpark to let's go revisit the benchmark plan. Let's not open it up to non-preventive stuff. You know, because I understand uh, from Robin that who was around the first time that it can be a real food fight and and waste a lot of people's time. So, you know, as a board member, I'd be more than happy to put some kind of criteria on a review that just limits it to better alignment on the prevention front between the all payer model 
you know, and, and the benchmark plan, you know, that we're asking the insurers to offer. Um, so that's just a suggestion. Um, but it just, you know, that that plan goes back to 2012, I think. And, uh, you know, a lot of the world has moved on since. And uh, um, it's it's just that that non-alignment on pre-diabetes just is, is like a sore thumb to me. Um, and the other thing is uh, the cost shift. Um, so, so as you went into the the um, budget process with the legislature for 2021, there was uh, in the presentation that that but for federally mandated increases, there will be no um, uh, increases in reimbursement rates uh, for for Medicaid in 2021. And I, I just I, I and I understand the cost shift. I'm I don't have clean hands on this either. Totally um, going back, but. Um, you know, it, it just worries me that that the cost shift is siphoning out of the all payer model one care efforts, uh, you know, savings and efficiencies that are being found, um, and they, they they don't stay within that network. They get siphoned out through the cost shift, and I'm just wondering if uh, you know if at AHS, uh, you know, looking at caseloads going down over recent years. Um, if some kind of um, uh, standard guidepost can be set for on a per member per month basis or some other metric where people can have some assurance where Medicaid will fit in terms of their money coming into into um, you know the financial networks that we're dealing with. I, I, it just to me seems like a, 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 a you know a, a, an unknown. And, and we keep whistling by the great graveyard of 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 of, medic, of, of the cost shift, and it, it's such a big piece of the pie that we can't ignore, it, but we kind of do ignore it. So that's just uh, another comment. the The third question was: I was just wondering, in terms of care navigate navigation, and and the um, what you you hear on that in terms of some people not liking it and some people loving it. And I'm wondering if you have any breakdown of that commentary associated with the different quadrants of health. I mean, do people love it who are dealing with patients that are 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 are, are, are uh, <clears throat> high users or very high users, and it does doesn't really do much for people that are you know kind of reasonably healthy, or is it an across the board critique of 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 you know that that tool? I think what we heard most, and that's why the recommendation is crafted the way it is, is that we need to sort of dig down in terms, if this is a user issue, if this is a, a software issue, or if this is a um, uh, a problem uh, that the data isn't getting, the right data isn't getting to the, to the right people at the right time. I think what we heard that it was all over the map, uh, uh, board member Pelham, it, it was all over the map in terms of this thing is terrible to this thing doesn't give me the information I need to Brattleboro, you know, hey, this this gives me the information I need. So we crafted the recommendation to say, hey, let's look at this to see what is going on here. Um, and let's see if we have to redesign what we've been doing with and, and we're willing to help with this with one care to look at this uh together um so we we didn't we got to the to the level of there's dissatisfaction let's let's take the next step find out why there's dissatisfaction in this and that's what the recommendation goes to yeah well, I'll be I'll yield back the rest of my time to Jess to see if she can ask you some other questions that uh, uh, <laughs> that, that uh, yeah. so, those, those are my issues. Yeah. Thanks, um, Maureen. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, uh, thank you for this presentation and and um, you know really all of us collaborating together to kind of work move forward on this. Um, a lot of my questions have already been asked, but you know, I just want to also talk about you know recommendation seven and um, really how we get more participants on the commercial side when we look at um, many of the players 
Vermont is a, is a small piece of their pie. If, if you look at a Cigna or someone that, like that, and you know, how, how are we going to get them to participate? And without that, you know, and without having a larger amount in fixed perspective payments, it creates a lot of strain on the system. You know, one of which we heard from the hospitals in particular, where it was almost the reverse effect. So what was happening is they're getting, you know, first of all, the, the, the care they're providing for everybody, you know, is going to be the same whether they're on the ACO or not. And the intent obviously is to provide the best care for everyone. But we know one of the potential outcomes with the ACO and what we're trying to do and getting to people earlier for their care is it pushes them out to lower cost of care centers. And when the hospital receives fixed perspective payments for those patients, um, if that savings is achieved for those patients, that, that's a benefit. However, for all the other patients, what they're telling us is those patients are also maybe moving out to these other cost of care, lower cost of care centers and, and you know, working on obviously the best quality of care. But that's creating this huge gap then in their budget because you know they they have obviously high fixed costs. So without getting into higher fixed perspective payments and getting more of the population in there, you know we heard that was creating a great strain, right? So it wasn't just what they received from the ACO and the true up on the ACO. It was really almost the true up on the rest of the population and moving that out. So so you know, don't know what the answer is, right, to get these players in from the commercial side, but, you know, that's going to really be critical to get the scale that we need. So don't know if you can add anything else to that. And um... No, we, we heard the same thing, and we probably heard it from the same, same uh, hospitals as well um, in terms of, uh, you know, you got to get scale. Uh, and one of the things that... Um, I'm hoping to be as uh, persuasive to some of the payers uh, on the advantages of uh, coming into the uh, the all payer sort of value based system. Um, I'm not going to be Pollyannish about it. It's not going to be an easy sell, but at the same time, I, I think we got to reach out to the payers and say, "Look, you know, this is this is where we want to go. How can you be?" How can you be partners with us as we move forward and and figure out a way? And and uh, you know as as it has been said earlier, I, I think you know we're gonna we're gonna have to have partners in state government saying the same thing as we move forward. So um, I don't have a magic bullet on that, but what the, the what the recommendation is driving at is I need when I can and there's a vaccine coming uh, when I can get out. Um, and get out and meet with these, well, I can still meet with them, um, but um, meet with these, uh, uh, with these executives of these companies and say, what can we do together? And let's, let's try to move that as uh, quickly as we can, um, uh, more on the short-term, medium-term uh, uh, side. And, and I know it's listed as longer-term, but I always... Uh, drop things down a notch every time I read things. So let's 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 try that. You you raise a really good question that we just we've got to work through. And then when when you talk about um, uh, several of your strategies are on strengthening the ACO leadership strategy, and um, you know we're obviously a small state in Vermont. We only have one ACO. Um, is that a pro or a con in in you know moving forward and um, nothing against one care just a question right is that is that going to benefit us to having just one aco or you know in a system would it have been better to have multiple acos for participation you know i didn't i didn't really here's how i approach it i've got what i've got and yeah, so well, let's 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 make it work with what what we've got um i haven't i haven't even thought about that because right now i I don't have it. Uh, so, you know, it, it it's a great question, but it really didn't play at all in what what we were doing as we were moving forward here. 
no, I, I agree with that too. It's more just what, who knows, right? But whether they want yeah. to. Um, that's all I had, everything else that was really already asked. So thank you. Great, thank you, Maureen. Before I open it up to public comment, I understand, Robin, you have another question? Yes, um, one other thought that occurred to me that I meant to um, ask you about is uh, in the blueprint delivery system reform model, there are really three components, which are the payment itself, uh, the data and analytics, and then the practice facilitation. And uh, the, the way that model works at the primary care level, as you know, is practice facilitators are actually contractors of the state, but the individual practice can choose which kind of facilitation they're interested in, lean or Six Sigma or microsystems, whatever. And then the hard work of actually changing the operations is, of course, at the practice level. We don't really have that for other provider types. So at the ACO level, we have the payment change and we have the data and analytics, which is obviously a key piece to make the delivery system actionable. But we haven't really, as a state, identified whose responsibility it is to uh, own that delivery system operational change, which in my view, necessarily has to at some at some level be owned at the provider itself because the provider needs to do the change to their own business operations. But I was curious your reactions to that and what thoughts you had in terms of our model and whether that's another area that we may need to kind of beef up or be more explicit about as a state. I think we, I'll let Ina answer the, the, the bulk of the question, but I, but what, what sort of uh, caught my attention is not necessarily beef, beef up, but the integration of the two um, two systems that are out there. Um, we got the ACO, we got the blueprint, and the, sometimes the two don't meet in the night. Uh, and how do we bring the two together as we as we look at it? And I think if if you read sort of the 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 report, it, it talks about that and, and how we can bring sort of, I, I you know, we're, everybody's working hard and everybody is rowing real hard. The problem that we're having is the coxswain is, we got three different coxswains and, and they're, they're, they're shouting win the row, row at a different time. And I just want one coxswain. I just want everybody moving in at the same time at, this, uh, at a fast speed, I hope. Uh, and and we're not seeing that with the two examples you just brought up. Uh, we're just seeing a no integration at all. So, Ina, did 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 I get myself in trouble, or did, what did I do here? You're on mute. You're on mute. I'll just smile my way out of that question. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> um, in in the recommendations. Um, it's it's in the section that's about strengthening the strategy and and um, where where we say fostering a culture of continuous improvement, innovation, and learning through focus on data and systems for improvement. Robin, you're talking about a system for improvement in the primary care um, uh, space that was established through the through the Blueprint for Health um, program. Those quality facilitators are are a Part of a system for improvement on the information that's been provided through that program and i think you're right that those systems for improvement are not applicable across the entirety of the integrated system that is a part of this a part of this model and where services are subject to the total cost of care target and I don't know that we have a prescription for for that in the report, but it is an area certainly in relative to um, the entrepreneurship, um, relative to thinking together about how we uh, how that is accomplished, because that, that work does have to be accomplished for more than simply the primary care system. So yeah. I I would agree with you. Um, and that's an area to work on. Clear steps aren't in this report, but I think that's something we can work towards. Thank you. 
Okay, I understand that uh, board member Holmes has an additional question. Sorry, sorry, sorry. One quick question that I forgot to ask, but it was about recommendation 16, and that was around incorporating the social determinants of health screenings into the standards of care. And I just want to say I applaud this initiative, but I realize that more screening is going to undoubtedly uncover greater need, particularly around mental health and substance abuse. So. Um, and providing those community support services. So I just wondered if you had planned for increased resources available to meet that greater need, and, or is our community support system gonna be ready to handle more need that's gonna be uncovered? And again, I applaud the screening, additional screening, but just wanna make sure there's gonna be enough support to, to meet that need, whether that's been considered. Yeah, I think, you know, we've been looking at um, these areas um, pre-COVID and during COVID and hopefully post-COVID, um, and we'll continue to look at these areas. Um, I, I don't think it's been tied specifically to this recommendation, but in general, the agency has been looking, how, how do we determine, um, you know, it's not only mental health, it's, it's it's food security. It's a lot of things that are out there, education, uh, a lot of things that are out there. So um, when we talk social determinants of health, um, you know, and I've said this before, I'm a big believer in social determinants of health and what it can do to sort of uh, bring our, our, our cost structure under control uh, as we as we move forward. So we're going to have to uh, we're going to have to you know, integrate some of this with the larger agency sort of mission as we move forward. And and, and throughout the, uh, in, in various parts of the report, we talk about bringing the agency uh, along with what we're trying to do here as well. And I think you pointed out a, 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 one of those areas we're going to have to focus on. Okay, thank you. That was quick. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to open it up to public comment. Does any member of the public have any public comment? And I just saw a hand go up. Uh, it's Mort Wasserman. It's Mort Wasserman. Go ahead, Mort. Hi. Uh, thanks for allowing the public in on this fascinating discussion. I had a couple of comments that have to do with technology. The tendency to want to demonize or turn to some form of technology. Uh, demonization meaning, oh, this is terrible. That's why we can't do it. The example here is Care Navigator. The very fact that Brattleboro finds this tremendously useful and everybody else or lots of other folks find it difficult suggests that the problem isn't the software, but the system in which the software is implemented. And I know from having been a clinician that the thing that maddens clinicians of all sorts, social workers, care coordinators, physicians, nurses, PAs, is having to do something twice. Because there's not even enough time to do it once. So I think that um, it's easy to de demonize Care Navigator and there's plenty of problems with it. But the real issue is find out why Brattleboro works and what can be done to help the rest of the health service areas in the state be more successful, whether or not you stick with Care Navigator or get a new tool. The second thing was really a, a question just because I think that the integration of electronic health record data and claims data is some sort of uh, holy grail in making systems better. Uh, but, and the HIE has, has taken incredible steps to become more sophisticated and getting data to uh, one care and having single uh, individuals identified 95% of the time. But claims are a completely different beast because they're not mature for six months. So the notion of some sort of real time claims uh, EHR integration is really challenging and it might be uh, not worth what you can get. The real gem of integrating claims is to find out what actually got paid for. 
Pharmacy is one perfect example where electronic health records just tell you what was ordered, but not whether anybody ever picked it up at the pharmacy, let alone took it. So I, I, I think it's a great idea, but probably more of a long-term solution. I'm excited to hear that there's a pilot going on with Medicaid, which is, I think, the most workable group right now. Thanks. And more, just to uh, jump in on that, it's not that, uh, um, at least from the, the doctors that I've spoken to, that they thought Care Navigator was useless. What they, the, the problem that they were um, referring is that um, they felt they had to try to have three screens open and it wasn't practical. And that's uh, the feedback that, that I've gotten at least. No, I think that's correct. You mean you have to jump out of your electronic health record into a second system. And that's and and that actually if you you can interface the two systems, but that's a lot of work. And the interfaces change all the time. So but I, I agree, uh, Chair Mullen, that's exactly uh, one of the big problems. OK, thank you. Other public comment? Kevin, Mike Fisher here. Go ahead, Mike. Um, good afternoon. Thank you. Um, I guess I want to start by uh, appreciating the call for uh, transparency uh, and um, uh, and transparency of data. Um, I think that's important, and, it, and I think it's both important for the board and for the public. I appreciate that. Um, and then I also, I, I think I'll make this more as a statement than a question because I think it's a big question. It's a big, it's a big statement. Um, and it's sort of in line with a question that member Holmes asked earlier. Um, given the financial stress that uh, hospitals describe, um, which by the way, is very closely related to the financial stress that Vermonters, uh, small businesses and uh, other purchasers are experiencing, I'm afraid that it will be that that the the nexus between uh, reducing the risk such that um, providers will be able to participate um, while at the same time driving the kind of system change we're all hoping for here um, pushes it in opposite directions and and I I, I just am am worried about that um, and then I'll also say. Um, as long as we hear from Vermont who can't afford to pick up their insulin or similar stories, either, whether they be from the commercial marketplace or be on Medicare, um, consumer affordability is pushing in exactly the wrong direction here. And and as long as those stories continue to come to me, um, you know, or we continue to struggle with trying to find strategies to deal with those dynamics, um, uh, our work is much harder uh, in uh, in in bringing about the change that uh, that we're all hoping to achieve here. So I, that's my comment. If you if you have a response, I'm welcome. And if you don't, that's also okay. So not hearing any, um, I'll ask for other public comment. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Secretary and uh, Madam Director. Um, we applaud the uh, work that you've done to date on this and uh, thank you for your leadership. And um, the Green Mountain Care Board is committed to doing all that we can on our end to um, uh, make sure that this model is given a fair chance. So um, thank you very much. Well, thank you for your time and uh, happy Thanksgiving to all of you and just keep in your thoughts. Uh, we have a lot of state employees working uh, tomorrow and, uh, and Friday. So uh, keep them in your thoughts as well. So thank you very much. It'll be a strange one. My wife uh, took the day off to uh, cook the standard feast, and now uh, there's two people. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's going to be strange. Uh, as as, but if uh, we all behave, the state of Vermont will be much better off.
And if we don't, the uh, the trajectory is scary. So, right. um, so we'll uh, we'll see you later. Thank you very Thank much. You. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving to you too. Well, thank you. Thank you, Wally. <laughs> oh, thank you, Wally. That's the highlight of the day. Yeah. It is. And it's tough to even transition from that to the next discussion. <laughs> but Susan, are you going to tee up the next discussion for us? Sure. It's it's pretty straightforward. And I don't know, um, Ina, if you'll be able to... Oh, she just went off. I don't know if she'll be able to stick around. It's fine if she can't. Um, we are just going to give a... Um, Brief overview, our staff, uh, Elena Barabi and Sarah Kinsler are going to give a brief overview of a response to a uh, warning letter we received um, a couple of months ago. And then um, they have a request to, and they'll get to this through the slides, to delegate um, the chair, uh, Chair Mullen and staff, to continue to work on this let letter but they will get into all of the details, but we'll review the high level parts of the letter, have a discussion, have public comment, and then uh, go from there. And I and if I, I would assume we'd have a vote too um, when they set that up for you, if you're Thank ready. You, Susan. So we'll turn Thank it you. over to Elena. Great. Thank you. Um, so I will share the slides. Uh, let me know and you can see. We can see them. Great. So I'll just give you kind of follow up a little bit um, on what Susan kind of laid out. So this is um, about the scale target warning and the response that we've been working through. Um, so in this presentation, we'll go through background, review scale performance to date, um, talk about the work that the staff at the board have been um, doing in this regard, even prior to the um, issuance of the warning, um, and then you know the work that we've done to formulate to work with our co-signatories to formulate a response, and then we'll outline next steps and hopefully have a vote. Um, and I'll turn it over to Sarah to get us started. Kinsler. Sure. Thanks, Elena. Um, can folks hear me? We can. Excellent. Um, so a little bit of background. Um, we've known from the start of the all pair model agreement that the scale targets included in the agreement would be a real challenge to, to achieve. Um, and, and we know that because to be attributed takes a couple of steps. So in order, in order for an individual to be attributed to an ACO and count towards scale, they have to be covered by a participating payer, and then they have to see a participating primary care provider in those cases. Um, so there are a couple factors that go into scale that we list here. Um, provider participation or the ACO's network. Um, as folks know, this is a voluntary model, so the state does not require anyone to participate. Um, secondly, payer participation. Um, again, voluntary model for payers, uh, and there are some types of payers over which the state does not have any control um, or kind of regulatory influence, um, and that includes Medicare Advantage plans, self-insured employers, and federal employee and military plans. Um, and then finally, uh, care patterns and attribution methodology. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in order to be attributed to an ACO, an individual has to see an ACO participating provider. But what we found when we first started measuring scale was that a surprising number of Vermonters get the majority of their care um, out of state, either because they live in a border community. So for example, people who live in Eastern Vermont and seek care at DH um, or snowbirds who get their care down south for part of the year or some other reason. Um, a 2018 analysis um, that our data team performed, which was actually included in the performance year one scale report showed that even if every Vermont primary care provider participated, we would be under 80% um, for, for Medicare scale. So under 80% of Vermont Medicare beneficiaries would be ACO attributed, um, either because they seek a lot of care out of state, because they didn't have any historical spending to qualify them for attribution, or, or maybe one or two other reasons. Thanks, Elena. So considering all of this, um, we can see that the scale targets in the agreement are extremely aggressive, especially for Medicare, where we're tasked with bringing 90% um, of Medicare beneficiaries into the model by the end of the agreement. Um, as you can see, we have a problem there. Um, this chart lays out our current performance. Um, and as a reminder, uh, the board reports on the state's performance to CMMI annually every June, um, six months after the end of each performance year. Um, so that here we list, um, we list performance for PYs three and four 
And those estimates are really preliminary, so we won't report those until 2021 and 2022, respectively. Um, but we can estimate future performance based on the ACO's budget submission and based on data that we receive from Medicare. Um, as you see, we're still quite away from the target, especially for Medicare. Um, the next slide um, is a chart which shows, um, which sheds a little bit more light um, and shows that we're really excelling on the Medicaid side in, in terms of participation, but that um, Medicare is not meeting the targets and commercial is lagging, especially self-funded plans. Um, because we've anticipated that meeting scale targets um, would be a challenge from the start, the state's been really working on strategies to improve scale performance since the start of the agreement. Um, so to give you an overview of a couple of these efforts, in 2018, as we were first working to develop the scale measure specification, the signatories discussed potential changes um, to the scale denominator with CMMI, or I should say st signatory staff, um, discussed potential changes to the scale denominator with, with CMI, um, and that, that resulted in the exclusion of patients who are enrolled uh, in Medicare or Medicaid for partial benefits. So for example, only Medicare Part A or only Part B, um, and, and folks with Medicaid limited benefit packages. Um, some hard to reach populations were already excluded per the agreement. That includes the federal employee plan, TRICARE and the uninsured. Um, and then there were a couple of populations where federal partners were kind of not willing to bend at that time. Um, and those include the self-insured, um, even folks, even self-insured plans who aren't, who aren't submitting to VCARE. So we don't, we don't have, um, data on, on members of those plans. Um, we think that that's about 85,000 members based on pre go Bay, VCURES data. Um, Medicare Advantage plans, which at, at the time of that analysis in 2018 was about 11,000 people, but we know that this is growing. Um, and then Medicare members who are ineligible for attribution, for example, because they hadn't been continuously enrolled for, for 12 months. Um, then in 2019, the board and AHS fielded a survey of hospitals and FQHCs to understand opportunities and barriers to increasing participation on the provider side. Um, findings for that survey are available at the link that I embedded in the slide. Um, the findings also identified some strategies to address the issues that were found to be barriers. Uh, and the state, federal partners, and the ACO have made some significant progress in addressing some of these. Um, the ACO was also identified as the lead for many of these strategies and is asked to provide details on their scale strategy annually through the board's ACO oversight work. Um, so now the, the letter that um, Executive Director Barrett mentioned, um, the board or Executive Director Susan Barrett received a warning letter in September notifying Vermont of a triggering event for, um, for the all care model agreement. Um, that, the, that Vermont had not met scale targets for performance years one and two. As we talked about a few minutes ago, um, it's the board who supplies the data that kind of informed that determination. So this was not unexpected, nor was it a surprise to us. Um, our response uh, is due within 90 days of receipt, so we have until December 13th to respond. Um, on October 12th, uh, Executive Director Barrett sent an acknowledgement letter um, to CMMI indicating that the signatories would work together to develop a response. And since that time, board staff have been working with the other um, signatory staff to do so. And now I'm gonna hand it to Elena to talk about um, the, the strategies that we've identified in that, through yeah. that process. So there are really two components of the scale targets. Um, the denominator, which Sarah talked about at length about what were measured against across the state in terms of um, population and, and who's included in the model. The numerator captured who is included in the model. Um, so, you know, and that's broken out into two primary groups, so the Medicare scale and all payer scale. Um, and for all payer scale, because we've already talked about the Medicare strategies, we'll talk about commercial strategies and strategies that can really um, kind of link across all payer types. Um, and a lot of these are going to look familiar because um, they were developed and then included, I think, in, in the um, AHS's report. And so, you know, I think a lot of those will look familiar to you. So we won't spend too much time going through these all over again. But, you know, we talked about the reduction in the risk corridor. This allowed Rutland to join the model in 2021. So that was um, a good, good result. Uh, proposed benchmark um, for 2021 to ensure that that's stable to allow providers um, some confidence in, in continuing their participation. Um, 
request that CMS offer written guidance for best practices, uh, for cost reporting, for cause receiving Medicare prospective payments, um, and then thinking about you know, how we evolve the Medicare payment and attribution models um, as we go forward. The commercial strategies, you know, I think we're excited to hear that the state employees have um, have are now joining the um, the model. Um, you know, I think Ina spoke at length about you know the education that um, is expected to kind of um, unfold around self-funded participation, where there is the largest opportunity. Um, you know, we can think about teachers, hospitals, and, and the broader business community. Um, and then for the all-payer strategy, you know, I, you know, Sarah mentioned that. Uh, this is something that we already kind of look at in our ACO oversight process. Uh, so we will certainly continue to ask the ACO to report on their scale strategy, uh, provide any updates to the activities that were identified in the 2019 scale survey um, that was conducted by the state, and then submit um, a work plan to, so we can understand how they, they expect to achieve some of those goals um, and activities outlined in the survey. Um, I think issuing the healthcare provider stabilization grants was um, was very helpful and um, conditioning those grants on value-based payments. So we did see some participation um, kind of um, linked to that work. And then pending the ACO budget review, you know, this certainly needs to go through the board process and staff need to complete and come to you with our ACO um, budget recommendations. But you know, we can start thinking about how could the ACO intensify its all-payer approach to provider participation, or how could it refine its uh, risk model with the goal of statewide participation across you know, a variety of pay, um, payer types. Um, so next steps for the letter, we would request that the board chair uh, or that the board delegate to the chair to continue working with staff. Um, and the APM signatories to finalize this response. Um, and if that seems appropriate, that we've drafted some language here with the help of our legal team. And then, um, you know, the reason why this would be so helpful is, you know, while December 13th felt so far away, it's it's now just around the corner. Um, so we still need to kind of finalize the letter, route for signature, and submit the response to CMS um, by December 13th. So that is the goal. I'll turn it back over to you, Kevin, if there are questions. Thank you, Elena. Questions from the board? I guess I have more of a comment than a question. You know, I think it's good to go back to um, PMMI to talk about changing the denominator. I, I'm not particularly optimistic about that because quite frankly I've we've done it twice um, but I, I think it's good to do it again um, but I also think that and I guess this is more of a comment for you Kevin because I think it the process wise it there's really no way for us as a group to kind of micromanage sending a response so I'm all for delegating it to a board member to work with staff on but my comment would be I would be concerned about um, potentially reopening all of the agreement targets should that be a path to go down and and that's something which I think we're going to have to face in 2.0 which is right around the corner so that would just be a thought is that um, I think it'd be good if it if that those scale targets were more aligned to our actual authority but uh, I don't think it's necessarily mm -hmm. worth it to do a wholesale renegotiation when we're about to go into a renegotiation. So just a comment. Understood. Other board members. What a quiet group. <laughs> Would anybody like to make a motion? I will make a motion um, that the board delegate authority to the chair to work with staff and, and the other signatories to the model in formulating a response to the warning letter. I'll second it. It's been moved and seconded. Is there further discussion? Well, actually, I think we should open it up to uh, public comment as well. Um, before I open it up to public comment, though, is there any board discussion? Hearing none, I'll open it up for public comment.
Hearing none, we'll go back to the board. And um, is there any further discussion? If not, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion uh, carried unanimously. Is there any old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, before I take a motion to adjourn, again, I just want to echo the earlier comments and wish everybody a, a very happy Thanksgiving. It'll be a Thanksgiving that we'll never forget <laughs> as we uh, sit in our small groups, but um, we are getting through this. There is light at the end of the tunnel, and at some day we may actually have a board meeting in person. <laughs> so um, with that, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Don't eat too much turkey. Have a good one, folks. Bye. Happy Thanksgiving. Out. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you.